Well, hello and welcome to our program about anti-Semitism on college campuses today. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. I'm really looking forward to tonight's program as I think you're gonna hear some concrete ideas about what students can do when they face anti-Semitism on their campus to try and make a difference. I will say this is also obviously a, a, a kind of key moment when we've got increased tensions uh, and increased voices of anti-Semitism, not necessarily on campuses only, but throughout the world because of the events taking place in Israel. So I'm looking forward to hearing what our, what our panelists say. But before I introduce our panelists, uh, I wanna put in an advertisement for some of our other upcoming virtual programs. So if you will just give me a moment, uh, this coming Thursday, HMTC is going to mark Cambodia's National Day of Remembrance to honor the victims of the Cambodian genocide with a program about uh, with a program with two professors from Yale University who are going to draw from a new book they've just published on political violence in Southeast Asia since 1945. They're going to talk about the events that took place in Cambodia, describing them in the context of the Holocaust and other atrocities in Southeast Asia and then talk about the collective memory of genocides. I think it's gonna be an interesting program. Then this coming Sunday, May 23rd at 3 p.m., HMTC is partnering with the National Holocaust Museum in Amsterdam for a virtual showing of an award-winning documentary about the hidden child survivor, Leo Ullman. And after the film screening, Leo Ullman is going to moderate a panel with the descendants of some of the family, some of the rescuers for his family, uh, who, who saved his family in Holland during the war. And one more to mention, next Tuesday at 6 p.m., we'll be holding a virtual book discussion with the historian Edward Westerman about his new book, Drunk on Genocide, Alcohol and Mass Murder in Nazi Germany, which was published by Cornell University Press earlier this spring. You can find information about these programs and our full schedule events on our website, at www.hmtcli.org under the events tab. And I also hope you'll go to that website and click the Give Now button and make a donation to, spot, to support HMTC's virtual program. Okay, enough advertisements. Uh, let's get to today's program. Uh, we have three recent graduates as our panelists this evening, each of whom is going to speak for a few minutes describing their experiences with anti-Semitism as college or graduate students. But before I call on them to our virtual stage, I am delighted to bring out uh, State Senator Anna Kaplan, who is going to uh, introduce our program today. Senator Kaplan, as many of you know, was originally born to a Jewish family in Iran. When the Islamic revolution swept that country, her parents sent her to the United States for safety. And luckily later were able to follow her and settling here in initially in Queens. Senator Kaplan would go on to attend Yeshiva University and the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law and raise two children in Great Neck. In 2011, she was elected as a councilwoman for the town of North Hempstead and in 2018 became the first Iranian American elected to the New York State Senate. One of the issues that she has focused on in her years in the Senate has been the need to stop anti-Semitism. Last year, she introduced four bills aimed at combating the rising tide of anti-Semitism and hate in New York State through education, awareness, and stronger hate crime statutes. And just last month, she introduced a new bill that seeks to improve the way the Holocaust is taught in New York State schools, saying, I'll quote her, in a time when disinformation is exploding, and anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic violence are on the rise, it's never been more important to teach the lessons of the Holocaust to the next generation. So I'm very pleased that Senator Kaplan can join us for this program and I pass the microphone to you, Senator Kaplan. Thank you, Thorin. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be joining you here tonight on this Zoom event. Um, I have to say, I wanna thank you, thank the Holocaust Memorial Tolerance and uh, Tolerance Center of Nassau County for all the great work that they do. And I have to give a plug to whoever has not visited the Tolerance Center should really go and visit because it's a source of so much information um, that really I think 
from young to adult to older generation, there is something there for every single one. So if you have not made uh, a trip up there in Glen Cove, please make it your job to plan a visit up there. Um, I want to thank you for this virtual panel discussion about anti-Semitism on college campuses. I've attended several of these over the last few years. And I have to say, it is always really important to hear from college students, graduates, about their experience so that those who are planning to attend very shortly can learn from those experiences and to have some sort of a guideline what to expect, and when something does happen to them, how they can react. As Tareen mentioned, I am a proud uh, elected individual. I represent New York, New York State Senate for District 7, uh, which is the North Shore of Long Island, and it loops to NASA, to Western NASA. And um, as we have seen in the last few years, um, anti-Semitism has really um, exploded. Um, we're seeing those hate symbols throughout our districts, throughout our communities, communities that we always thought were safe haven for all of us, very inclusive and accepting. So it is really important that we make sure that we do everything in our capacity to send a message that we will not stand um, for this, we will all together united will stand against anti-Semitism, against hate, and that we are inclusive and that our communities are really special because of all the different people who come here and really contribute and make our communities what they are. And that an attack on one group is an attack on all of us. Um, I remember a couple of months ago, I was looking at some studies about how New York State is doing in terms of educating um, Holocaust to, their, to our residents, to our children at school. I have to regrettably say that New York came and was at the bottom of the 50 states. And anyone who knows me knows I'm very competitive. I always try to be top, um, performer, but I think it is so important for us to make sure that we have a good solid education for our children so that they know the history. I truly believe those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it again. And as we always say about Holocaust, never again. It is imperative that we do everything in our power myself as an elected, to make sure that we have a good, robust education throughout the state so that every child can walk away having a full knowledge of what happened. That's why I partnered with my assembly member, Nili Rosick. We introduced the bill, uh, S-121, which I am working very hard to be able to pass in this legislative session where we can, the Commissioner of Education can actually take a look and see how each district is teaching Holocaust to their students, which districts are lacking, which districts are doing a good job, and to come up with some sort of standard uniform um, guidelines so that we can do a much better job of teaching our children. With that said, I wanna thank you again for this opportunity. If anyone has any questions, and even if you're not from my district, I hope that you know I'm only an email or a phone call away. And I also have to give a plug to your Sunday event with Lee Allman. He is one of my constituents. I've been blessed to have met him and have heard his story a couple of times. For all of you who don't know who he is, I really recommend you to participate and, his, and hear his story. It is really um, heartwarming and it is really a wonderful education for each and every one of us. With that, I'm gonna pass it to you, Turin, and thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Senator Kaplan, for leading our program off. Um, oops. For leading our program off and for introducing it so nicely.
Um, at this point, I'd like to bring out the first of our panelists. We have three panelists. After all three panelists have spoken, uh, we will make time to open the floor for questions, which I ask you to pose using the Q&A function of Zoom, but we'll make sure to make time for it after our three panelists have made some initial comments. Our first speaker is Matt Wigler, who grew up on Long Island, then attended, sta attended Stanford U University before earning a master's degree as a Mitchell Scholar at Trinity College Dublin in 2020. He is currently serving as an Annenberg Fellow teaching at Eton College in England and joins us from the other side of the Atlantic. So Matt, thanks very much for being with us. And uh, I'll ask you just to, as a lead off, can, if you'll share some of your experiences at Stanford after coming out of Nassau County. Absolutely, Thorne, and thank you so much. And um, thank you to Senator Kaplan um, as well for your wonderful introduction and for all that you do uh, to promote Holocaust education in New York State, which I think really is a key um, to a lot of this. Um, and it's something that as an educator right now, um, as um, Thorne mentioned generously, um, I'm currently a teacher in the United Kingdom where there have been um, no less than 53 violent attacks on the Jewish community here in the United Kingdom just since Monday, a 450% increase. Um, and, you know, in that context, I found it very important to educate my students. I teach politics and English here about the Holocaust and just finished up a unit with them on Elie Wiesel's um, really profound Holocaust memoir, Night. Um, which I think riveted a lot of students to think about this question in a way that they otherwise wouldn't um, if it hadn't been assigned to them. Um, so I, I grew up on Long Island um, in you know Great Neck, New York, went to Great Neck North High School actually with Senator Kaplan's daughter um, in my class with me and didn't really anticipate um, the anti-Semitism that I would experience when I got to college. Um, by the time I was in my freshman year at Stanford, it had become pretty apparent that, you know, out there on the West Coast, there was a real problem um, with anti-Semitism, with the way the Jews were treated on campus. And I came together um, as a co-sponsor with a number of other student organizations across the political spectrum, APAC, J Street, which, you know, is, is a, you know, liberal um, pro-Israel organization, the Jewish Student Association. Um, Cardinal for Israel. So lots of different groups, you know, representing the full left to right spectrum of, of Jewish thought and Jewish perspectives that might exist on a college campus to put together a very simple resolution for the student senate um, saying basically just that anti-Semitism is a problem at Stanford University and that the student senate is committed to taking concrete action to fighting it. A pretty, you know, anodyne um, bill to put through. Unfortunately, um, when I went to present this bill, and this is my freshman year at Stanford, so I'm 19 years old, um, the Student Senate doesn't see this as quite so easy an issue as I might have thought it had been. Uh, first, a girl says, actually, you know, Jews are the Nazis of today, looking at a list of things that we list as anti-Semitism, saying comparing Jews to Nazis is, is anti-Semitic. That's when I start thinking that maybe things are about to go south. And um, sure enough, they do um, when one of the leaders of the Senate, um, a senator by the name of Gabe Knight, gets up, takes a deep breath and says, um, you know, Jews control the media, government and economy. And he goes on to imply that, you know, it's the job of the student Senate not to protect Jews, but rather to question um, power structures in which he thinks that Jews are disproportionately powerful and in fact, try and dismantle that power that that's a legitimate thing to do, something that student leaders, you know, as, as scholars and as activists should be thriving to do. Um, so I get up uh, very calmly and try to explain to um, Senator Knight, um, you know, how exactly what he was talking about, that those exact tropes are, are the ones that paved the path to Auschwitz, that incited um, the Holocaust, you know, age old, century old tropes um, that had been weaponized against Jews. Um, and instead he got up and he insisted once more um, that what he said was, was right, that he has no need to apologize um, and that it's actually audacious of us to come forward um, with a bill about anti-Semitism when Jews are being so terrible to the Palestinians. Again, echoing the you know, Jews and Nazis comparison. So 
we thought um, that in response to this, um, that you know people would be on our side, that people would recognize um, Senator Knight's words for for what they were, and rally with us. I went back to my dorm that night, you know, a freshman, really upset. Um, and talk to my RA about this saying, hey, I'm upset because I just heard this from a student senator. And the RA says, well, is he wrong? Don't Jews control the media, government, and economy? Um, and as I tried to lead an activist effort um, against calling on Senator Knight to, to resign and also calling on the Senate to pass this bill, I realized that much of the school was, was not with us. Um, in fact, that much of the school wasn't with us. Um, those were the days of Yik Yak. I don't know who remembers that. It's a bit of a blast from the past now, but it was an anonymous sort of Reddit-like thing um, specific to your college communities. And Yik Yak was filled with people um, defending Gabe Knight, but it wasn't just done anonymously. It was done in op-ed after op-ed um, in the um, Stanford Daily, our student newspaper, defending him. Um, and by every group um, that refused to withdraw its endorsement. In fact, the coalition of um, marginalized students um, made up of a bunch of affiliated groups representing students of color, they refused to unendorse uh, Gabe Knight. Um, and in that election, I decided to throw my hat in the ring, but I actually um, ended up getting less votes than he did that year. So that's the starting place of the story. The starting place is that anti-Semitism was bad and I was confused trying to think, how, how do I defeat it? What can I do? But I promise you that this actually becomes a happier story because I come um, speaking to you today as a former ASSU Senator myself, because my senior year, four years after that, not only was I elected to the student Senate, um, and not only did I take my seat after um, a long unconstitutional effort to try and deny it to me because I was quote unquote, the Israel or the Zio Senator. Um, but I also on the Senate managed to pass probably the most sweeping um, piece of legislation uh, combating anti-Semitism um, that Stanford has seen and that's still on the record um, effectively putting the IHRA um, definition of anti-Semitism on the books at Stanford as the criteria for judging anti-Semitism. Um, calls for Stanford University to follow suit with the University of California and create an independent task force to um, take on this issue and expressing a commitment um, by the student Senate to undergo um, anti-Semitism sensitivity training um, with each new coming Senate. So how did we get from point A to point B? How did I get from you know, going to the Senate with this resolution um, on we saying that we oppose anti-Semitism and getting told that Jews control the media, government, and economy, and then move on to a place um, where we were actually getting bills passed, making a difference um, as, as a student senator myself? And, and the answer to that question is um, never ceasing to have conversations never ceasing to be open-minded and learning a lot about um, how intersectionality um, has been um, weaponized against Jews um, and especially against Israel. Um, so as to defuse some of those false analogies um, that are very powerful actually on both sides of the Atlantic, if I have time to tell my story about what it was like in Ireland as well, where false analogies that compare the Israel-Palestine conflict to the Northern Ireland conflict dominate a poisonous discourse around Israel leading to BDS having passed at Trinity College Dublin where I got my master's and actually Ireland being amongst the few um, countries in the Western world where their Senate um, actually passed BDS. Um, the only reason why it didn't happen is because it was vetoed by the Taoiseach, um, but he still faced an enormous amounts of pressure on that. Uh, but what it comes down to in the end is um, right now there's an idea out there that if you're going to be a ally um, to people facing injustices, if you're gonna be an advocate for social justice issues, then you have to subscribe to a totalizing and reductionist um, set of beliefs that includes um, a total um, dispossession of Israel. Um, I consider myself to be a progressive. I was the vice president of the Stanford Democrats. Um, it's always my wish um, to you know, be there fighting for justice, 
um, with other people who are facing injustice. For me, the fight against anti-Semitism is deeply linked to fights against other forms of injustice that people face. But unfortunately, um, the narrative that's been perpetuated out there is that if you want to stand against other injustices, if you want to stand for Black Lives Matter, if you want to stand for women's rights, if you want to stand for um, you know, the rights of immigrants um, or disabled people, then you also um, have to disavow the state of Israel, disavow Zionism, um, reject the idea of Jew Jewish indigeneity in our homeland, or even our right to live there um, and, and not be killed by rockets um, in order to be considered a, a good Jew um, who has access to those sorts of progressive um, places. Um, and for you know people who aren't connected to that, um, it's very hard for them to understand how actually um, combating anti-Semitism, because it functions so differently than other kinds of racism, other kinds of oppression, which often teach us that a different group is less than someone else. Anti-Semitism tells us that Jews actually are like Gabe Knight felt more powerful than other groups, that we have disproportionate control over the media, the government and the economy, right? They portray Israel as Goliath um, against a Palestinian David when the truth is that Jews have always been David, um, you know, against the whole world that we're seeing on social media this night um, has always um, been hostile to us and hostile to our right to defend ourselves. Um, whether, you know, in, in actuality or even just on social media or in a campus space, the only way to diffuse that is to have conversations with people, is to explain to them that our fight um, for our um, rights and for our recognition, our defense of our identity is deeply linked to the rest of theirs and to show up for them too. Um, one of the things that I did in the aftermath of the Gabe Knight thing was to organize a rally um, that brought together uh, members and leaders of all different marginalized communities at Stanford. Um, we had, you know, Latinx um, organizations um, speaking with us. We had um, Indian American organizations. Um, we had um, all disabled organizations. Every organization that I could get to come to the table to have a rally against anti-Semitism together where we also spoke up about their issues. You know, linked arm in arm, singing together, shalom, salam, in one, you know, glorious line of solidarity. That's how we make the change. And when I got to the Senate and still now, um, I insisted on having difficult conversations um, with people who, you know, frankly, didn't have enough education about these issues to be informed about it. And I needed to point that out to them because the most dangerous thing in this discourse is when people know enough to be very confident that they're right, but not enough to know that they're absolutely wrong about what they think about this conflict. Um, but reaching out and being kind harder than the way that you reach out makes a difference. I've had conversations, even though I've been graduated for two years now, with um, former colleagues from the Senate, um, and even a friend of mine who I met through this, the former student body president of UCLA, who I actually got to take down a rather anti-Semitic thing that ended up on his Instagram story through ignorance um, by having a conversation with him. And I encourage all of us to get out there and talk you know, to be even handed um, in the way that we deal with things, but to be honest um, in expressing um, the issues that we face. And I, I hope to answer um, more questions um, from you guys about some more of the details of the tactics and the strategies um, that we've been able to use to break through to people. Um, I have plenty of stories to tell both about Stanford and about Ireland, and even now about here in the United Kingdom where I'm teaching. Um, but Michael and Jocelyn also have amazing things to say, and I'm going to cede the floor over to them, but please do ask questions after. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. And I'm sure that your, your comments uh, have, have given us that, that spark, and I think we'll be getting a bunch of other questions based on that. So thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I wanna introduce our next speaker. Oops. Um, our next speaker is Jocelyn Kleiger. Uh, Jocelyn also from Long Island, but instead of going to college out in California, Jocelyn stayed right here in Nassau County attending the Webb Institute, one of the top schools in the country for naval architecture and marine, gen marine engineering, but it's located in Glen Cove. She graduated from the Webb Institute in 2019 and is about to start a PhD program in civil engineering at Oregon State University. She, I think, has a somewhat different set of experiences at a very small, prestigious school right here on Long Island. So Jocelyn, can I get you to come out here? 
Hi, um, thank you for that introduction, Thorne. Matt, thank you for sharing your experiences and your very insightful words. And Senator Kaplan, thank you so much for the statement that you gave earlier and for all you do for Holocaust Education in New York State. Um, so as you mentioned, my experience is very different from Matt's was. Um, Webb Institute has about 100 students. And um, of those 100 students, I was the only practicing Jew on campus. Um, I don't know if I was the first Jewish student to take off for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but I was the only one to do it during the course of my four years there. Um, honestly, I had an imposter syndrome about whether or not I should be a part of this panel because, um, you know, I didn't go through the same type of thing that Matt did and Matt and I have known each other for years. So I, I had an understanding of what he had experienced at Stanford. And while the things I experienced at Webb weren't great, they weren't at that level. And also we don't have a student government. So I didn't have any student senators saying these things to me. And I voiced these concerns to both Matt and Thorin and um, they encouraged me. Um, and it's, anti my, it's anti-Semitic microaggressions that are insidious and that inherently lead to more extreme acts of anti-Semitism and more extreme anti-Semitic beliefs. So we all agreed that it would be a good idea for me to come and share my experiences because they're kind of at that crux of when you feel like something is wrong, but you're not sure. And the most important thing that I learned was to trust your gut when it comes to anti-Semitism. Um, and there's no right way to be Jewish. There's no way to be Jewish enough. There's no way to be um, discriminated against enough. Any anti-Semitism in any form is bad. And it's important to trust yourself when you go through these things because if you're not your own on your own team, it's hard to advocate for yourself. Um, so the web student body praises itself on being apolitical, even though being apolitical is inherently an endorsement of the status quo and inherently a decision to give into internal already existing biases. Um, so what I experienced at web from a sociological perspective, it was sort of interesting now that I'm a couple of years removed to look at what happened while I was at web and think about what that says about society, about our education system and how we deal with historical education, Holocaust education and education dating back to the middle ages, dating back to the very conception of Judaism. Um, so, uh, in some cases, um, what I experienced, I couldn't quite explain why it felt wrong. Um, the most recent one I can think of a few months ago, um, someone that I considered a friend um, said that Jews are smart. And I told him, you can't say things like that. And he asked me why, because it's a compliment. And I had a really hard time uh, vocalizing this. Um, but being the only Jew and constantly going through these experiences that felt wrong, the word objectively wrong, um, it's, it's very isolating and it's very lonely. And I wish I'd had a Jewish community behind me um, when I was going through that. Um, and I had a lot of difficulty in um, verbalizing what I was experiencing um, and expressing why it was offensive until Webb undertook a DEI initiative. Um, and it was only then that I could put words to these experiences that I was going through. And this was very, very recent. This was about a year ago. So it was after I'd already left college. So the, the main experience is that um, the bulk of my um, experiences with anti-Semitism involve essentially becoming a caricature of a Jew, um, tokenization, and some interesting internal biases. So when I first got to web, Holocaust jokes were everywhere. This was 2015 before Charlottesville. So to a lot of people, anti-Semitism was a thing of the past. And I'm gonna touch on that a little bit more later but um, they didn't fully understand what um, anti-Semitism or what this type of joke actually meant or the underlying meaning behind it. And you know, when you get to one of you and a hundred other students making these jokes, it gets incredibly tiring to go through every single time and explain why. And then you always get the response that, oh, but I'm not a Holocaust supporter. I'm not a Holocaust denier. I wouldn't do that. It doesn't matter if you do. Um, if we as a society accept that it's acceptable to make light of the situation, then it becomes more and more acceptable to push that in more extreme directions. Um, Matt mentioned that uh, Gabe Knight said that Jews control the media. No one ever said that to me. However, they used it as a Snapchat handle. Again, blase nature towards anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic history. Um, 
someone asked me uh, for my first month of college, he comes up to me and he asks, oh, um, so uh, when I was growing up, I always heard that Jew was extremely offensive. Do you prefer to be called a Jewish person? And no, I'm a Jew. He meant nothing malevolent by it, but him growing up, learning that being a Jew is a slur, he was, he's from New Hampshire. Um, but him growing up and hearing that the term Jew is a slur was really eye-opening to me because, you know, I'm from Nassau County. I'm, um, my school, uh, high school is about 30% Jewish. This, it was so foreign to me that, uh, I still struggle with that one, honestly. <laughs> um, in my freshman year for Hanukkah, I invited all the other um, students to come down. I had my menorah. I was going to light candles, do the prayers. Uh, figured like if someone wanted to see what it was like, it's, it's Hanukkah. It's not the biggest holiday in the world. So um, I figured it'd be nice to get everyone involved, get everyone in a bit of a festive mood um, to show them just a little piece of Judaism. And they they ended up having people with cameras come down and taking flash photos of us in the middle of the blessings and me and all the other students looked at each other and started giggling and it felt so I felt like an animal on display it was really uncomfortable <laughs> like oh look what that thing is doing it it was very very strange but they were doing it for PR purposes they were doing it to try to promote to to try to promote web as a place where Jews could be comfortable to try to encourage other Jewish students to possibly enroll. And so I understand why they did it, but again, that feeds into the tokenization um, that I experienced there. And then there was a girl who tried to get me to make challah bread with her. I do not know how to make challah bread. I don't know why I wouldn't know how to make challah bread. Bread making isn't a thing I do in my spare time. This was pre-COVID, so it wasn't even that sort of excuse. Um, she was trying to seem like she knew a lot about Jewish culture, but in doing so, she created a caricature of me and it was uncomfortable. Um, so one of the most revealing moments that I ever had was this boy from North Carolina told me that he had never seen a Jew before. He had some vague concept that, they, that we existed, but it wasn't until he saw me that he actually understood like, oh, wow, they're like actually just walking around around here. And what he actually said was that he'd read about Jews in history books. And that connected a lot of dots for me because uh, it speaks to the general tone of history and Holocaust education and speaks to the importance of it because the way that anti-Semitism is currently taught, it's taught as a feature of World War II that started it and ended with it. It's not taught as a continuum and it's not taught as something that started far back, as far back as Jews have existed, as something that ramps up and comes in waves, something that ha was experienced here in America. For example, the Miss America immediately after World War II was Jewish, and they had to stop the tour because people kept on coming up to her and saying, my son died because of you. And she was a victim of so many anti-Semitic attacks, but we're so blind to the anti-Semitism that happened here in America because it's taught as part of German history, not as American history. So I think it's because of that, that we lose a lot of the context into how it happened and how it can be avoided again and the underpinnings in a society with anti-Semitism and how those can become more and more dangerous if left unchecked under time. Um, and I had one, um, institutional example of anti-Semitism. Uh, I left campus for Rosh Hashanah to go observe with my family. And during that time, a professor assigned a test. He informed us of it after the holiday started and the test was to happen the day I got back from the holiday. So there was no way I could study for it. So I reached out to him, got no response, reached out to the Dean, no response. So I had to take the test and I did well, but it was a very, very stressful experience. And because I went to a college of 100 people, I had pretty direct access to the administration. So um, I'm very fortunate that I was able to see tangible change. The dean actually approached me and asked me for help um, in uh, including um, religious uh, discrimination into Webb's tolerance policy. And he asked me for help in how to word that and how to make it specific enough, but also vague enough that it could apply to not only Jews, but all religions. And it wasn't until I sat down with him to try to go over this that I realized how inept my vocabulary was in terms of communicating anti-Semitism, in terms of um, expressing how to avoid 
religious discrimination because a it's very difficult to make something big enough to encompass all religions i can't list all the religions in the world off the back of my hand so how can i possibly verbalize how to accommodate them but at the same time i could barely express how to accommodate jews myself um i'm gonna try to wrap up here um so matt mentioned the importance of having difficult conversations about anti-semitism but with a series of microaggressions, it becomes incredibly exhausting to have to constantly educate others about Judaism and about anti-Semitism. And frankly, it's not an individual's job to fix a lacking education system, but it's also important to stand up for yourself and to call out anti-Semitism where you see it. So that way it doesn't become more normalized. Um, earlier, I mentioned that Jews, uh, that I was often told that Jews are smart, and um, I was met with confusion when I said I was uncomfortable. Um, however, if we as a society decide that Jews are smart, then it's not that far off to say that Jews are cunning. Um, if you're comfortable identifying the type of discrimination that you're facing, for example, tokenization, um, lacking historical context, um, internal bias, it's incredibly helpful. Um, most of these stereotypes stem from horrific history, and it's very, very time consuming and uh, a little demeaning to go through the history of usury in Europe with every well-meaning but ignorant person that you come across. And by identifying it, you shut it down and validate your own experience without having to explain why you are entitled to that feeling. Because yes, if someone had, uh, if you are the victim of a microaggression, you are entitled to feel uncomfortable and you don't owe anyone an explanation for that. But yes, there, there's more people on your team than you realize for this. Matt mentioned the intersectionality um, of anti-Semitism and other forms of racism. And one of the things that's going on at Web right now is that they're having DEI training. And I hope to get um, anti-Semitic training involved in that as well. Um, and I mentioned before that I did not have a language to express what I was experiencing until Webb's DEI initiative came into play. So there's a lot for people advocating against anti-Semitism and people advocating against racism can learn from each other. And I was the only Jewish student and there were about two or three students of color during my entire time at Webb. And you know, hopefully um, if you can join forces, you become a much more powerful being. You can learn from each other and you can advocate with and for each other. Thanks very much, Jocelyn. I really appreciate it. And as you said, I definitely did encourage you to join us and think that um, a lot of students out there probably are at places where there's not a large student body and where um, they, they face the same kind of issues that you face. So thanks very much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, we're, we have one more panelist before we're going to open the floor to the Q&A. And uh, so uh, let me introduce our final speaker, uh, who is Michael Mantell, who offers, again, a different perspective about the dangers of anti-Semitism. Michael Mantell attended Hunter College in New York City as an undergraduate and then a few years ago, finished a master's degree at Hunter's Silverman School of Social Work, and he now works as a psychotherapist in New York. Michael, I hope you can get out here and we'll share something about your experiences at Hunter. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can hear me and see me? Yes. <laughs> All right, wonderful. So uh, thank you, Thorin, and uh, thank you to Senator Kaplan. Thank you to everyone at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center as well for putting this important uh, program together. Uh, thank you to everyone watching and thank you to my co-panelists, uh, Matt and Jocelyn. Um, my name is Michael Mantel. I'm the son of a Sabra, an Israeli and a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. As Thorne said, I'm a psychotherapist and educator. I teach Hebrew, Judaic studies and modern Jewish history. Uh, and I co-host a virtual Zoom program called Sundays with Survivors, uh, which I co-created with the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. I graduated from CUNY Hunter College in New York City with a bachelor's in psychology and a master of social work at the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College. As a student and as an alumnus, both on campus and continuing online, I experienced and witnessed anti-Semitism from faculty, staff, students, and alumni up until this week. Uh, 
sometimes in subtle forms and sometimes more blatant. These attacks come mostly in the form of offensive, often abusive allegations and name calling, and have also manifested in the destruction of property. So before I continue, I wanna remind you that uh, what I'm about to share happened within a master's level program at a school of social work and in New York City, one of the greatest cities in the world. Uh, instances that have occurred within the Silverman student and alumni community include, but are not limited to, referring to Jewish Zionist students as the oppressor, a student walking around campus with an F Zionist t-shirt, alluding to Jewish control over Hollywood, equating Jewish landlords as New York City's worst, referring to the state of Israel as the new Nazi Germany, putting Israel in quotes and suggesting that it does not have the right to exist, claiming that the state of Israel should be dismantled, excusing the murder of Jewish Israelis as merely retaliation, claiming that Jewish people, including students, use the Holocaust narrative to silence and oppress other minorities, stating that it took a massacre like the Poway synagogue shooting for the Jewish community to realize that there was a problem and posting an anti-Semitic article from a neo-Nazi website. We also found a SWAT sticker etched into a dispenser in a bathroom on campus. Worse than the barrage of disparaging and demeaning acts and comments is the support of them and for the students who make these remarks. Conversely, when st Jewish students have made neutral remarks about Israel, including sharing solidarity with Israeli social workers, who were protesting for better working conditions or discussing the need for Holocaust education or standing up against anti-Semitic violence. Uh, students expressed their rage at us, uh, downplaying and discrediting the role of anti-Semitism in the world and at our university and resorted to allegations and name calling. For example, when the anti-Semitic article was posted in the same thread, Jewish students were expressing their shock over the posting of this article. One student replied to Jewish students that our outrage was, quote, a testament to vast power and privilege experienced by Jewish people living in New York City. Additionally, students wrote that, quote, someone in social work school should cruise all types of websites because one never knows who their next client is. Someone referred to reading the article as, quote, being culturally aware. Another student wrote that at least uh, the original poster, quote, did a great job of sparking a conversation. And the original poster wrote that she, quote, read past and through the other ignorance that was weaved around the story. So to give you a little bit more context here, the website was called jewishproblem.com. And throughout that website, if you clicked on the link from the article posted, was a banner of SWAT stickers. There was also an image of a rat with the Star of David. There were many articles blaming Jews for 9-11. In addition to the mission of the website calling for a Jewish free planet and other disgusting comments made in the article was a sentence, quote, it's high time Jews start being viewed as cockroaches or any other pest to be exterminated without exception. Now I'll remind you that the original poster the person who posted the, the article said, she was able to read past and through this ignorance. Jewish students, religious and secular, those identifying as Zionists or not, have explicitly expressed their fear and concern over the anti-Semitic comments and over the lack of empathy and understanding from the Silverman School of Social Work community. Also, many Jews privately expressed that they were too afraid to speak up and that Jewish allyship seemed all but gone. In 2015, after I graduated, in 2015, we started an online Jewish pride group for students and alumni of Silverman School of Social Work. During that year, uh, a bunch of al alumni, student, alumni and students uh, brought to the attention uh, of the administration the SWAT sticker that was found on campus and the anti-Semitic article that was posted. The response from the administration seemed slow at best and sometimes dismissive. For example, a, a meeting that was scheduled was canceled last minute 
And despite numerous attempts to reach the administration, they didn't get back to us for over two weeks or about two weeks. The end result was to transfer the work from the uh, Dean administration to a student led social justice committee, which um, ended with frustrated students leaving the committee due to a lack of initiative to combat anti Semitism. So, fast forward to last year, 2020, after students called to dismantle the state of Israel, called Jewish, Zion, Jewish Zionist students oppressors, referred to Israel as Nazi Germany, and said that Jewish students and Jews around the world use the Holocaust to advance our goals, I reached out to the administration once again. It has now been almost a year since we began speaking, and we've had numerous meetings. During one meeting, one of the deans said the swastika on campus was very small and barely noticeable and said that the school did all that was legally required. My response was that their legal and moral obligation to protect their Jewish students was thus far ineffective and their actions clearly were not enough. One of the deans said that they would include an article that discussed anti-Semitism. I asked to be involved in the process of choosing an appropriate article. The uh, administration dismissed this request. The article that the administration chose to speak about anti-Semitism includes, among other statements, the following. Zionism was at heart a colonial enterprise. At each step throughout the year, this past year, um, it felt like the administration was working against us on this endeavor rather than with us. Most emails I sent were either not responded to or questions within those emails were ignored. I presented a number of resolutions to the administration, including that the administration put forth a formal statement defining and publicly condemning anti-Semitism. I requested an investigation into how the administration handled prior anti-Semitic incidents, so we know that well, what worked, what didn't work, and what work still needs to be done. I proposed creating a combating anti-Semitism task force made up of faculty, staff, students, and alumni who would review all relevant class and professional development materials. I recommended that the administration seek out other ways to educate students about the diverse Jewish experience and our contributions to social work in the world, not only just our experiences related to anti-Semitism and Holocaust. I discussed with the administration the importance of being able to talk about anti-Semitism as a standalone topic rather than one discussed in a conversation about all other isms or steeped within a con uh, um, conversation about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I reminded the administration that anti-Semitism isn't only an outside problem that we need to include in the curriculum, but we also need to address it as a problem that we see within our university and the greater social work community. I request that anyone creating a real, uh, related course work or professional development content um, have some background or expertise on anti-Semitism and the uh, Jewish experience. And a colleague went even further and suggested that any professors discussing the topic have a background in de-escalation and conflict resolution training. Uh, two weeks ago, we finally uh, were presented with an action plan from the administration. It seemed vague and piecemeal. We've reached out uh, to the administration for requests for follow-up meetings and for our questions uh, regarding the action plan to be clarified. Uh, we still have yet to hear back from the administration with any concrete plans moving forward. So while this might sound like a downer and not so positive, uh, the work is far from done. I've learned from this experience to not accept anything substandard. Any endeavor worthwhile and worth something is going to take a lot of time, energy, and attention. Also, this is not a project that I need to handle on my own, and this can be a multi-pronged approach. With that, as I mentioned before, I've co-created and co-host a virtual Zoom program called Sundays with Survivors with the Holocaust Memorial Intolerance Center. And I'm working on additional programming and teaching young people about modern Jewish history, because I understand that our energies need to also be in strengthening our community. Um, additionally, I'm working on a project that speaks specifically to the Jewish experience at Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College. 
Uh, to that end, I will say that sometimes affecting positive change within an organization, or in this case, on a college campus or at a university takes years sometimes. It starts with one person or just a handful of people. And sometimes it takes doing the work outside with our community first. Uh, so with that, thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, and I'd like to thank our, our three panelists for uh, their comments and their feedback. Um, I'd also like to invite all of the three panelists to come back out for the Q&A session. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for, for sharing not only what you experienced, but drawing our attention to some of the things that you did that were effective or at least could be effective. And I, I think that that's one way to take our conversation going forward. I'd like to invite the audience to use the Q&A feature of Zoom and type in questions they have. And I know that there are already several questions that have come in. And so I'm gonna to jump to uh, some of those. And, and I'll start with one that gets right to it. Somebody writes, they're a college student here on Long Island. And one of their classmates started engaging in anti-Semitic rhetoric on a, an, an app that was being circulated. The student reported this to campus security and wanted to remain anonymous and campus security said they couldn't do anything. So this student asked, what is something that they can do when they see a classmate being targeted on campus, when they see anti-Semitic stuff going on on campus? Can you offer some, some suggestions for what uh, a student like that could do? Yeah, I'll um, start if that's all right uh, with everyone. Um, number one, I think the most important thing is to understand you're not alone. Um, so reaching out to the community um, outside of your uh, university, uh, also reaching out privately to each other students so we know that there's support. Um, it's also important to remember that what happens to us on social media, for example, is, is something that other people can see and witness. Sometimes it's important to let certain things go. Other times we do need to stand our ground. Um, and with that, if you don't feel comfortable saying anything or need help, we don't have to be knowledgeable about everything. We can rely on each other for that information. Um, as far as speaking with the university or the college um, security, um, never take no for an answer. <laughs> um, go to somebody else. Uh, and also it doesn't have to be on campus. Uh, there are so many officials um, and organizations you can reach out to, alumni from other schools or, or your own. Um, so you're not alone in this. Uh, and uh, again, this is something that uh, you can reach out to us um, or anyone else um, who can assist you in that. Uh, but the one thing that I would just end on is uh, don't take no for an answer, not, at least not the first or second time, and don't accept anything uh, that is uh, some standard. Others of you, other feedback for this student? Uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's very hard to um, get recognition from your university sometimes when your safety is at stake. Um, I recall there was an incident where actually another elected student senator at um, Stanford posted a video, or sorry, posted on Facebook um, a message um, saying that. Um, he planned to physically fight all Zionists on campus that he encounters next year. Um, you know, threatening physical violence against members of the Jewish community. And the Stanford administration was well aware of what was going on, but refused to take any action, you know, for weeks about the whole thing, as basically the entire school defended him about it um, when anybody brought it out there. Um, what I found to be effective when um, the university administration wasn't taking matters seriously was to get other people involved, um, national organizations and national figures. Um, I know there are questions further down about what groups are good. Um, some groups that I worked with um, in that situation, I worked with um, the World Jewish Congress um, with Ambassador Lauder, um, who was incredibly helpful in that situation, who got on the phone with the president of our university. Um, I worked with Zionist, which is an incredible organization that I would recommend to anybody and was on the phone with their director, Amanda Berman, who's wonderful um, and helped provide us with legal advice. Um, there are tons of people um, out there who are willing to help. Also, um, AEPI, I was a part of, and they, they you know, always provide support for these things. I think one of the problems that we have is we don't have a system that you know, aggregates and shares all of these issues that pop up 
um, across our universities in one place. You know, there's no single, and they do this well in the UK. Um, they have a council here where, you know, you have a central place where you report all different incidents to, and then they're able to lay us with the government and compile these statistics. There are so many instances of anti-Semitism, like the ones we've spoken about, that just go unnoted just are permanently, no one can find out about them because the right people don't know about it. And even when the right people know about it, they're not talking to each other or putting it out there. I think aggregating those statistics is big, which is why I think um, both Michael and I, as part of our activism, um, have focused on trying to put, um, you know, committees together and task forces together to, to try and handle this problem in a more systemic way with concrete actions and, and with education. Um, because some of the time the university administrations don't recognize very clear anti-Semitism as an issue because they don't have the, the vocabulary um, to talk about anti-Semitism or, or, or the context in which to recognize it. Because it is so different, again, from other kinds of hatred. Um, that plague us, but you're not alone. You're with us. Um, if you want to reach out to me, my email address is mwiggler61g at gmail.com, or you could friend me on Facebook or Instagram. I'm wigglerm. I want to talk to you. I want to help you. Let's trade advice and um, let's get this situation sorted. Thanks very much, Matt. And I will just say there's a, a as you said, somebody posed a question about what are some organizations and you've mentioned some, and we'll try to include some in a follow-up email that we send with ideas of organizations or groups that people can contact. So we'll try and pull that together for everybody. Um, I wanted to raise a, another question that somebody had posed, which, um, which is about the, the sometimes blending of anti-Israel policies and anti-Semitism and how those fit together or how those should fit together, how those shouldn't fit together. And I wondered if any of you would respond about your experiences facing uh, comments about Israel that have become anti-Semitic comments. Anybody want to try that one? Yep. Um, Matt, you want to go or? Um, do, Jocelyn, do you want to? Or? Um, I went to a, a campus that stayed out of politics as much as possible. No one would have touched Israel with a 10 foot pole there. So I can't speak to the um, conflation of anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic politics specifically. Um, I can speak to students' reactions to what happened in Charlottesville, but I can't speak to anything beyond that because that's not something I witnessed personally. Um, so, so one thing that I've found is that a lot of the time you get to say whatever you want that's anti-Semitic and dress it up as, no, I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about Zionists. Um, and that becomes a very convenient way for people to skirt around the issue. Um, also, when people do outright anti-Semitism. So Gabe Knight, for example, said Jews control the media, government, and economy. Um, Hamza do threatened to fight people physically. And then they say, oh, this isn't about anti-Semitism. This is I'm being silenced because of my opposition to the occupation. Um, and we all recognize that that's not what's happening here. But um, people have managed to weaponize this idea that um, people are being silenced around Israel. In fact, you know, sometimes they literally make things up about being silenced around Israel. We've been seeing a lot of that on Instagram now. Um, but in any event, um, I think it's very important to be clear eyed about, um, you know, what, that moment when anti Zionism definitely does become anti Semitism, which honestly, they're very close to each other, um, to be frank, right? Um, once you start denying, um, you know, Jews the right to exist in their homeland or deny, I think that if you deny any Jewish link to the homeland, you're in many ways trying to erase, you know, the very essence of Judaism. Um, which in so many ways is linked to, you know, the set of traditions that we maintained in far flung diasporas to maintain a connection to the home we were exiled from and to each other and all the different places of the world where we were. Um, and, and once you erase that history, once you erase that indigeneity, you're already trouncing on a lot of what Jewish identity is about. And then once you go the next degree and say, actually, you have no right to be there, go back to Europe. Um, well, then that's just patent anti-Semitism. Um, so I think that that's something that we should be um, looking at for sure and, and being vocal about. We can't just let people say, oh, I didn't say to you, I said Zionist, excuse me. We can't let that happen. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, if I can also just share, I, I think oftentimes on, on, on my college campus and in the social media 
world, um, a lot of the quote unquote policies uh, that were discussed were actually just allegations. Israel is an apartheid state. Um, uh, it's a Jewish uh, regime. Uh, those aren't policies, those are allegations. So if you ask people questions, well, can you tell me which policies you're referring to? I think trying to uh, put people uh, on the spot, uh, asking them questions so they can explain themselves is really, I, I think, what we need to do. Because again, this is just an allegation and no one is stating a fact about a policy. I think that's the most important thing uh, from what my experience, at least on college campus and social media. Thanks, Michael. I, I know we're running short of time. I wanna get to uh, at least one more question. Um, somebody wrote in that uh, about something that happened in 2019 when President Trump then issued an executive order about the punishments for anti-Semitic acts that said Jews who experienced anti-Semitism anti could be considered to have been targeted on the basis of their nationality or race. And his action led to a huge uproar about whether he was classifying Jews as a race. And I just wondered if this, something, if this was something that came up while you were at school, and if you recall, if it fed into the debates and anti-Semitism on your campus. So um, at least in my case, there weren't really many debates on anti-Semitism because there wasn't really much debate on anything. However, I do have a little term for something like this. Jews technically are an ethno-religious group. And as I said before, there's no right or wrong way to be Jewish. So I call it voice-blaining. Like when someone tries to tell you if um, you're actually Jewish or if Judaism is like a nationality or a religion. So it didn't feed into it. But um, the debate as to whether or not Jews get to classify themselves as a nationality, that is something that I umbrella under voice-blaining, builds off mansplaining. Thank you, Jessica. Other comments in response to that one? Michael? Yeah, um, again, I think it's all about just asking people questions. So most people who talk about the, um, the executive order have never read it. So I think it's important to just ask what they know about it. Um, essentially, the, the, the verbiage, the wording isn't that threatening, um, just like the internet. It's really how you use it. Um, and if we can use it for good, it's a protection, which is exactly what it is. Additionally, I would say, we, we say Am Yisrael Chai, we say the Jewish uh, people, uh, the people of Israel live, we don't say the Jewish religion lives. Uh, also, um, there's the Hebrew national hot dog, right? It's not the Jewish religion hot dog. So um, going from the biblical to pop culture reference, we are a people, we are a nation. Um, if people want to use that against us, um, that, is, that is not, um, I think, what the executive order uh, sought to do, um, and people who use it for that purpose are, are not using it uh, the correct way. Um, several people have raised uh, affiliating or connecting with the, the federal government, and I'm wondering about reaching out to your representative, congressional representative, senators. Was that something that you guys tried when you were facing your situations at your different universities? Did you find responses from federal representatives or state representatives? Uh, useful, or was that going too large? Unfortunately, I don't think every elected official is as good as Senator Kaplan is, um, or as much of a friend. I think that, um, you know, the dockets that um, our elected leaders have are, you know, large, and um, for many people, especially in places where there's less um, Jewish people than we have even in the New York area, where it's clear from Michael and Jocelyn's discussions um, that, you know, things are far from perfect. Um, it's even lower down on the totem pole. Um, I think that um, the best way to raise pressure is, again, there are lots of outside um, organizations um, that we could use, um, especially when dealing with university administrations and whatnot. Um, so just to get the names of a few of them out there, um, APAC um, was mentioned in one of the questions. I led the APAC chapter um, at Stanford uh, for two years. They're a great organization to work with, um, and I would recommend anyone who's interested, especially in Israel activism towards them and their bipartisan. So that's something that allows them to be taken more seriously, um, especially by elected leaders. Um, Zioness is good um, as an organization more on the left. Um, Stand With Us, um, I think, you know, is a great organization. It's, it's a bit of a louder organization, so it can be harder to use Stand With Us stuff to break in with somebody new to the Israel discussion. I think that's something that comes on later. 
Um, but there are loads of organizations out there. Again, an AEPI and AEFI, the Jewish Fraternity and Sorority, are great, 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 great organizations. And you mentioned Elon Carr. Um, and one of the questions, Elon Carr is, is phenomenal as a brother. So is Elliot Kaufman, who's also mentioned in the comments. We were together at Stanford. Um, and, and all of these groups together, I think all have important roles to play in different ways. Like the fraternities and sororities, for example, are important in providing social solidarity too, um, to people who feel like they're alone in dealing with this sort of thing. So I, I think that, you know, being aware of the various organizations that exist and not being afraid to reach out to them or building a presence for them, if one doesn't exist on your campus yet, that could be a good way to, to move forward um, where our elected leaders may fail us. Because um, unfortunately, um, it does take a lot of bravery right now to speak up um, against um, anti-Semitism. It shouldn't, um, but it does. And I wish that all of our elected leaders have the, um, had the bravery and the courage and the moral clarity of Senator Kaplan. Um, some do, and we should also do our best to elect more of them. That's the other challenge here. And I see somebody is chiming in to say, uh, to talk about Hillel's on campus as another place to go to often find assistance. Hillel and Chabad. And Chabad, thank you, yes. But uh, some other student organizations and other organizations on campuses that can be a big assistance. With that, I'm afraid we do need to wrap up. I wanna thank uh, Matt Wiggler, Jocelyn Kleiger, and Michael Mantel, as well as State Senator Kaplan for uh, being on our program tonight and sharing your knowledge and your experience. And I'd like to thank all of you who are watching today. We will send a follow-up with some more resources and we hope that those will be a help to anybody facing anti-Semitism today. So thanks everybody. Um, hey Thorne. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering um, if it's all right with you, I'd like to drop my email in the chat in case anyone has any questions or needs someone to reach out to. Just yeah, that way. I'll share it in the follow-up email. I'll share uh, okay. Matt's email and yours, Jocelyn. Michael, if you're willing, I'll share yours as well. Yeah, okay, so I'll make sure that people see that and, and uh, we'll be able to write to you to, to ask for help or guidance. Mm -hmm. We're here for you guys. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.